Hello, and welcome to Traverse. My name is Francisca Airy. I'm a theater and opera director talking to you from the Ram Theater in Budapest, Hungary. Every week I'll be talking to different industry professionals from all over the world about their careers, the shifts and adjustments they had to make during this pandemic, and their hopes and dreams for the future. This is Traverse. What's next for our industry? My guest today is the London-based Tassel Stevens. Tassels is a director, interactive dramaturg, writer, game designer, experience and interaction designer, performer, mentor, teacher, facilitator. He is also one of the founders and co-directors of the agency of Kony, a company of interactive theater makers. Kony has been creating work since 2006, collaborating with venues and companies including, but not limited to, the National Theatre, the Battersea Arts Centre, Headlong and the Roundhouse. Whether working on outreach projects, collaborating with a building, or operating internationally, Kony's work is always adventurous and often mysterious. They might invite their audiences to play through text messages, online games, or even let them play their shows on the streets of London, placing the audience members in the middle of the experience. Recently, Tassels has been working on adjusting to the new normal and bringing theatre to a platform we all use today, Zoom. Tassos, so lovely to have you here. How are I, you? I'm really good, thanks. And yeah, lovely to be um, sitting with you in a 600 seat theatre. Uh, 650, um, 650 actually. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, yes. Yeah, I am in uh, the Ram Theatre. It is actually uh, incredible to be in a building. When was the last time you were in a physical building, a theatre? That's a really good question and a really startling question. Um, uh, February last year, so basically a year ago. Wow. And what was it? I mean, I don't even remember. Um, I would have to kind of look through um, my ticket receipts uh, to figure out what it was. I know that I saw a, a memorable piece I saw about a year ago was, was um, Antigone at the new Dear Arma Theatre that Holly Watts uh, made, which was fabulous. Um, but I've been after that. But I mean, I should also sort of point out that in my, um, in a lot of my practice, I'm actually rarely stepping into theatres, particularly kind of as grand as that. Um, so that's kind of not usually where I operate. Yes, I actually wanted to ask you about that because as someone who doesn't operate in traditional theatre spaces, this lockdown and this transition must have been a bit easier for you. Maybe is that is that true? Um, I, I I'm certainly I'm I'm sure that sort of um so I'm yeah I'm uh sort of a maker of and artistic director of Coney. And um, when the first lockdown hit in the UK, I mean it's kind of a mixture of speaking personally that kind of like just the kind of the general existential crises of what's happening to the sector, what might happen to the company um and um and to i mean every every got everything like we we can have no idea at that point but we were so there was quite a lot of sort of like just just trying to figure out how to take best care of the company um and but, but i think certainly we were um in a much more relatively secure position than many others and like fortunate in that and i myself like sort of salaried um so again uh yeah i was i was in a much much more comfortable position coney's work i mean since the very beginning since before coney was coney um has always been sort of happening wherever the audience is and um and also like the very first work part of the kind of the starting points for that was just not being in the same room as each other not being you know so having an audience in the theater but we'd be miles away um and um so yeah it's kind of it's within the, it's it's within it's within the dna uh to be making play in this way uh so yeah and um because you mentioned coney you are the co-runner and director of 
the agency of Coney. I'm just trying to catch everyone else up who might not know about Coney. Um, yeah. How would you how would you describe the company? I'm going to tell you how I feel about Coney because the first time I found your website, even that felt like a like an adventure on its own. Um, and there's a, a real playfulness and and curiosity about every piece you guys make. Um, and could you just tell tell us about how you got involved with them and what Coney is about? Um, so I'm kind of closest to a founder of Coney, like um, that, if there were any one person, although it's not it's not as straightforward as that. Um, and um, it is there's something that we can kind of say playfully, but it's also actually true that kind of Coney uh, Coney is actually a front. Coney originated because um, we were doing other things, um, a group of us, and we needed the name of a company um, in order to kind of go on to security passes um, at a major institution. Um, and um, so we coined Coney Communications as a fictional PR company um, so that we had some things going to go in that slot so, so as not to draw attention to ourselves. And then a year later when we were thinking, this is back in like 2006, seven okay we need to kind of come out of the shadows a little bit um then oh yeah coney is quite a good name uh, let's take that um so it's always had a sort of an air of playful intrigue around it although becoming a little more straightforward as the years go on and we get older um coney it, we make all kinds of play um and to spark change that's kind of our mission and by play, I mean anything that people can take part in and play, um, whether that be theatre of an interactive, immersive, uh, participatory kind, or games of all kinds, not just video games or games that you play via screen, but also, yeah, any, anything that could be called that. Um, adventures, um, and yeah, and following a kind of a kind of a set of key principles, a principle of adventure, principle of curiosity, and a principle of loveliness. Um, and yeah, we're, we're now a charity and we're a national portfolio organisation supported by the Arts Council of England, um, which is one, uh, yeah, one of the reasons why there's a relative security for us compared to others in the sector. I, I sort of liken it met metaphorically to being like a buildingless building in, the, in terms of the structure of the organisation. So Coney HQ runs the building, and then, um, but the teams for projects, for the shows as it were, um, are drawn from a wider network of makers and artists. You know, if, you're, if you are a theatre director, you're primarily making work that for an audience experience, thinking about it like from that point of view, will, you know, the audience experience will start when they first hear about it. They'll then go to the theatre, they'll be in the bar of a theatre like this. Um, they'll kind of come sit in these incredibly comfortable uh, red velvet seats that you that can see you on, and maybe a curtain will rise, and you know, and then and then the play happens, and then afterwards they kind of go into the bar, and um, kind of etc. Whatever else happens after that. Um, so as a theatre director, you're kind of you're making the play bit of that whole kind of experience. Uh, for Coney, we're making we're or at least considering that whole experience. To the point that the audience first hear about it all the way through and kind of anything can happen that's fascinating and do you think uh do you think that kind of uh everything surrounding the experience of the performance can be curated now in the age of covid um i think it's a good question i i think it can be um yeah, I think it can. I mean, you were always making a space with the audience and maybe particularly kind of like in this in this moment that we're both going to be um, doing what we can um, and, to, you know, using use the platforms that, you know, we have accessible and also, you know, thinking for audiences, you know, where you know, we've made a lot of things on Zoom because, um, you know, everybody has been more comfortable to go on to zoom in a way that you know who went on to zoom two years ago like you know more than like once um and the idea i can do a show on zoom like everybody go what are you talking about um and now that's sort of that yeah that people are familiar enough with that in the same way that you know if you've never been to a theater that you had no idea what this was and i said hey look, we're going to the theater like yeah what we're going to sit what with, with like 649 other people 
like all you know like <laughs> what are you talking about <laughs> um so you so there's something sort of about yeah going to where the audience is already um and then you're always working obviously we're working within the limitations of what um a platform like this um can do and also like well an audience is comfortable like uh inside a platform like this but then yeah it's interesting like you know how can we conjure um the sense of a shared place uh for instance um which could be a segue to talk about telephone um if you like how did you know that that's going to be my segue to telephone <laughs> i don't know call it my spider sense so telephone uh i wanted to talk about telephone i saw this show to those who don't know about it um i think when it was still kind of on it in its pilot phase so maybe i'm i'm not really accurate in describing it so you will talk about it more but telephone for me was essentially a zoom show where the audience is invited to interact not only with the performance but with each other in um a, a bar a, a virtual bar and the only way i can describe it is gentle interaction which i think you also say it is definitely about gentle interaction can you talk a little bit about that yeah um so telephone i mean i should also kind of say that i mean so what one of the first responses like that we made um when sort of like lo the first lockdown happened in the uk was myself and david finnegan um another artist who represents coney um who and we had yeah we promised him some some work so um instead of that work we said hey let's do this so he and i ran a series of like rapid experiments where we made a new show every week in less than two days um that were then going to go out on zoom just as kind of as a scratch and just to, to kind of with a purpose both to explore what was possible and to learn like about how you could like make play usefully like around the, using these kinds of platforms but also because there was you know uh it, just to kind of connect with an audience and like to give some kind of sense of connection to an audience one principle that we kind of agreed on was that we wanted to make things that were live um but what's you now live is a very is a very interesting uh tricky word um tricky term kind of in like in theater because i don't mean by live necessarily you know being in the same room as somebody as you know as the performance that's not what makes it live for me live is a kind of a connection to the performance so that it is it, it is you are present together and that you're listening to each other and you can respond to each other and a sense of that kind of connection also that it kind of you know the sense that this is happening now like so if you're not here now then it won't, it won't happen but also what you feel because you know it is happening now and i felt that um whatever else we did making sure that there was a live connection between the performance and the audience but also how could we create uh work which would give the audience a kind of a, you know, a, a sense of live connection to each other because clearly that's what in you know in lockdown in some degree of isolation that's likely what we're all craving um so and then telephone was uh, partly coming from like there was because we were thinking about formats and i was thinking okay i'd like to try a storytelling piece because i also outside of coney like have made some pieces that are basically storytelling um and um that have often been quite personal and um thinking this might work quite well and also kind of within that kind of uh that kind of work this kind of gentle interaction where you're kind of placing the audience into it and you might speak to people individually like but you kind of you're always being held by the storyteller so it's kind of it feels safer um for an audience that might be nervous about extreme interaction it felt like this is kind of this would be interesting to explore over zoom because it actually yeah we have like direct address yeah we're always talking in direct address um i perform telephone using the gallery view in zoom so i can see as many of the audience as possible but obviously they don't know that i'm looking at them like without any individual on the screen in the same you know standing in a theater like i can make eye contact with you know any individual for a, a beat and that's kind of like the beauty 
for this kind of work is how you're kind of continually kind of connecting with the gaze. So yeah, it was thinking, okay, I want to make, um, want, to, want to try what it's like to do this kind of work. And then, okay, what's it going to be about? And immediately thinking it kind of has to be about connection itself. And because I also have a slightly kind of geekish interest in like older, like telecommunications. Um, and so, okay, put those two together. And um, and because really, like, and I say at the top of the show, that this is yeah, it's a it's a mostly true history of telecommunications, both universal and personal. It's about the kind of the um, the fragility of our technology to make connection across distance, um, and then written in this moment where we are now and we are still a moment of fragility and connection and distance. So yeah, that's that's kind of where it was like springing from, um, and then I yeah I stole a structure from myself from a previous storytelling show that I'd done like just in a theatre, um, which had a first act of short pieces which interconnected with each other. The second act, um, the audience uh, were down in the bar. It was also the interval, but I set up. Um, you know, inviting people, um, if they chose to, to um, buy a drink for somebody they didn't know, um, maybe have a conversation with them. And if they wanted to, to break the ice, here were some questions that they could ask each other um, over drinks that kind of resonated with the themes of the show, but also would mean that stories, might, personal stories might be shared between the audience. And then so I think, okay, I'll just steal that structure because I've got literally a day and a half to make this piece. <laughs> um let's make it easy i mean really that that yeah that interval that second act where an audience now in zoom in breakout rooms um are chatting with each other and i've asked them in advance to prepare an interval drink so they've kind of got back to hand and i similarly like you know post some questions they can ask each other that would like provoke stories like you know the kind of a phone call that changed your life for instance and um, maybe they'll talk about that. Maybe they'll talk about something completely different. That's up to them. Um, but um, more often than not, they do because, in a way, the whole show up to that point, you could also see as a piece of participation design that has been designed to prime people and get them ready and confident and comfortable to be able to then share what are sometimes, you know, remarkable stories of more power and truth than anything I could ever write. But this is kind of like a teleport. So we can, you know, we're now speaking between London and Budapest. Um, and, you know, audiences from all over the world can connect to telephone and they frequently do. And to have, you know, that sense of like, I'm talking to, as an audience, I might be talking to a stranger who's in, you know, the other hemisphere of this planet. And I'm, I'm, you know, they're telling me about the fact that uh, when they're growing up, their family home telephone number was one digit or different from the local fish and chip shop, and they're going to frequently going to get orders. For instance, one of one of the kind of the, the kind of comedy ones that I remember that an audience shared, um, and it's like that, you know, what there's something kind of remarkable in that. The simple, we're just kind of connecting um, in this moment all over the yeah all over the world. Um, and that gives the kind of the piece, um, the gesture of the piece, like kind of a, like an added power, I think. Not to mention that I think one of the one of the things that I really missed in twenty twenty is interacting with strangers. Yeah. Every every bit of communication was always very intentional. A call, yeah. you know, uh, for work or or personal, and even the people you were allowed to interact with, choosing your bubble. So acquaintances and strangers is something that I completely miss from my life now. That's really, I hadn't actually sort of like thought about that kind of quite so clearly as that. That's really true. Um, and there's something, there's something really important about what, what's at stake when you're talking to a stranger is something kind of quite different. You have no relationship. So there's, in some ways there's nothing at stake, but just kind of this present moment of connection. And you can kind of, you can kind of say what you want. And obviously, then there's the potential that, yeah, we might make friends. I mean, obviously, you know, 
we're friends now uh like in case anybody was wondering like you know but once we were strangers like and then you know things happen for us to become friends it's kind of like, that's just like that's, that's life so there's always that potential inside those interactions as well and one of the one of the lovely things about telephone is that uh people have made friends through the show my mum um who is in her late 70s and lives in the north of england um the first time she came no the second time she came to it um she's, she's a fan um <laughs> um and yeah it was you know it's kind of yeah i mean also to kind of point out you know she's she's not very mobile um so actually it's very easy for her to come to work that i've been making um in a way that that yeah wouldn't have been possible um before yeah before this um and um we were in the bar afterwards i should talk about the zoom bar um uh but uh and there was also there um a woman who was the mother of somebody that i've been mentoring um who lives in hobart in tasmania um of a kind of a kind of a similar age to my mum and two of them just like really clicked and you know chat for about an hour like with me and my sister kind of like oh okay yeah you don't mind us and then um and then they happened to bump into each other again because they both went to the delegation at the same time um and then since you know they've, they've kind of like become friends um they kind of write to each other um pauline's daughter jess who i've been mentoring like when i was up visiting mum um uh she arranged so that uh jess and pauline went walking in like the harbor in hobart um whilst at live streaming that to me and my mum um and yeah you know, for my mum that sense of like being in another place like it's kind of just yeah remarkable um but it's kind of you know it's that sort of the kind of the friendship that's kind of like made through this that would otherwise yeah not not happen it's it's theater going in in the covid era it's meeting someone in the bar and then finding um common things to talk about and then go to the theater again together i love that yeah you mentioned delegation and that's actually the next one thing i wanted to talk about because you are someone who um travels a lot for work and uh work internationally and you have collaborators all over um but maybe this time has allowed us to widen our audience as well wouldn't you think so and you have a piece called the delegation yeah that was um a kind of extraordinary like 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 it could it could not have happened at any other moment kind of piece basically um i made a connection with um uh an institute and a festival called Access Point in St Petersburg in Russia who near the st- the start of lockdown had because they were pivoting to kind of to kind of do their kind of program uh the theater makers like kind of going online so they basically googled online theater um found me and Tony asked me if I could like do a lecture um which I did so for about to the 50 people in Zoom but then they streamed to Facebook live and there was like 23 and a half thousand people like tuned into this surely I'm yeah I'm sure probably most of them about 10 seconds before clicking to a cat video but yeah hey it all counts <laughs> and then sort of from that was invited to kind of run a workshop for sort of 20 theater makers all over Russia um so sort of like from Belarus like right over to like the, the Siberian coast and then also uh a sort of in a kind of commission for the festival uh which was also online um to make a piece um called the delegation um which started from like thinking that just a kind of a gesture of the piece but the the, the impact there would be simply for an audience from the UK to meet an audience from Russia and um and in you know some kind of like playful situation which would mean that they would have a chance to meet talk to each other to exchange um played simultaneously in both so like russian and english the festival wanted something that would be uh have space for more kind of in, intense interaction what we sort of like sort of set, set it on as kind of a um uh 
the idea that the audiences are playing to delegations who would have been meeting in a hotel somewhere between um, London and Moscow. Um, uh, but because of the pandemic, then everything has kind of gone online. So the hotel has gone online as well and is like in Zoom. And then sort of with a, so the hotel is inviting you, you know, uh, come to come and stay in a hotel from the comfort of your own home. Like, so yeah, your own room is going to play your hotel room. And then the kind of the two delegations then meeting and a series of kind of um, vaguely surreal spins on like what sort of a delegation that's spending a long weekend together in a hotel might get up to but also ultimately trying to sort of set up a sort of kind of a power um in the world um of the piece because also the nice thing about about de about delegates is you're not you don't you kind of you don't really have power it's like you're here to sort of like you know do the kind of the show of like a negotiation but actually you know thanks for that actually yeah we're upstairs and we're going to be making the decisions yeah is that, is that, is that cool but and that sort of that dynamic and sort of yeah um the writer for the piece um and yeah, we were all kind of co-devising eve lee uh playwright was kind of really sort of, like, sort of taken with with this and so as the people are kind of playing there's also you know there is a diamond suite in the hotel that they can't access um they can kind of navigate through um off zoom into another online platform where we're kind of conjuring a little architecture for people to kind of explore different rooms in the hotel with the diamond suites the security guards and uh there's a passcode that you need um and you read yeah you know, you know, people want to get into the diamond suite um and then yeah a whole sort of a kind of simple but i mean hopefully kind of resonant then kind of reveal a kind of like what what happens when you get inside the diamond switch i'm not going to tell you because spoilers um there was huge scope for the audience to play freely um if they chose to um and which they often did because audiences playing audiences will, will always look for the trouble it was a very short run it was very intense um the technology broke several times we had to switch things um and the audiences ba basically when it when it was properly up on its feet it it was completely different each night um once ending in a dance party once ending in a in a like a, a kind of spontaneously self-organized political process um once ending with the elderly woman in australia showing her her photo albums of going to Russia in the 80s to this like the audience in Russia once ending with a yeah an incident that was very real which I kind of I probably can't talk about um but was one of the most sort of extraordinary electric uh moments and really difficult moments that I've, I've been inside like a bit of it like where something that was really in the room between some of the kind of the the russian audience um kind of erupted into like and kind of in reference to like something very real um that was happening in russia at that at that moment uh politically um that sounds like live theater uh yeah i mean like but i mean super live theater like um extra live um you know uh, you mentioned something that really caught my ear is that the tech going wrong and um, this might open up the question a little bit. It might be a bit of a broader question, but do you think um, interactive or play based theater in in the virtual world is quite dependent on tech? And do you have any advice for people who want to make this kind of work in the future, but might not be able to in the physical world? Um yeah i think i mean we're kind of i mean it, it is only it is only dependent on tech as our regular interactions like and how we kind of get together with people are dependent on tech i mean the tech is kind of i mean my first my first tip is always like don't focus on the tech and you know keep the tech as simple as you possibly can um 
and focus rather on and think even think about the tech in terms of like how what is it doing to in a sense kind of like, you know connect people like get to so like to talk about telephone briefly i mean i came like, you know using zoom um because zoom was like the most both the most accessible platform to an audience that most people understood um also quite robust compared to other video platforms very simply with telephone by kind of renaming so that i you know my zoom zoom says the coney zoom bar and welcoming people to the bar and playing pretending basically you know we're in a bar like and you know and you can imagine like you know there's a there's a dome and a fountain it's kind of a, one of those weird old buildings like weatherspoons pubs in the uk that take over buildings um and a kind of strange architecture so describing that a little bit and you know more recently you know kind of been throwing open a jukebox you know playing some music um you know and then you know inviting people just to post in the chat you know where where are you calling from so you know simultaneously acknowledging we're you know we're a bunch of people in a zoom different places all over the world but we're pretending we're in a bar immediately and both puts people at ease um but also sort of like i think makes a kind of stronger sense of connection um before we then go to the the you know into the theater um through um which yeah is going to be obviously exactly the same but um a curtain will rise and the curtain i, I brought it especially um played by my favorite coronavirus white cloth and um and this is this was literally like the first time i made it improvised finds before that ah oh, shit we need to find some way to signify we're going from the bar into the theater so here's the curtain and um and then and then playing a piece of music simply to go like this um thank you very much and it's you know it's that kind of like we're we're playing together that this is a theater and then that that immediately brings people um into that that kind of attempt so there's nothing in the tech beyond um using yeah just sort of using it to connect each other and then acknowledging the reality of that while then playing something on top of that you're centering the human imagination almost like a play yeah. a game of dungeons and dragons you, you don't allow the tech to take over the piece yeah yeah completely yeah. the other tip i think as well is also cuz uh, coney has made um it's a website that we have um called the pop up playhouse um which um has a set of kind of games and other pieces that people can play wherever they are and kind of kind of whenever they choose um one of those games for example one of those pieces is a piece called serendipity pile um which is for one person to play like with their phone um in the place where they are also with a pile of books there's another game called the wager which is like um the people to play sitting around a table and it's like you know how we can use technology i mean games lend themselves very well to this but basically just going to give like um send pieces which then people can play together um technology is facilitating that and distributing that but it's not you're not playing inside the screen um you're all you're playing you know, like you know, sort of with a screen that's supporting you interacting with other people or interacting like in the space that you're in um I think that's because I mean and I think it's difficult often to you know if things can go in too much into the screen then we kind of we lose our our sense of presence a little bit uh, so we're involving you know where you are and this physical space around the screen and keeping your attention there as much as like in in here um it was really important to think yeah thinking about it in terms of like what it what it allows you to do what opportunities it gives you the other and the other third and final tip is the technology will always break always like um so you have to be able to embrace that fragility and the simpler and more robust you can make it also because you don't ever want to be having to and that's an audience is really bought in in advance to and invested in I really want to do this piece if you're having to show them how to use a new platform and learn that then most people are going to going to go oh no okay, that's a bit too much yeah so like, so you in unless you're able to get that kind of that buy in from before they kind of like start playing then 
it's always better to use the most popular um, and kind of accessible platforms. I wanted to ask you a little bit about the future um, because we are in a very weird time, all of us. Maybe we've had a little time to get used to it, but this, this might change uh, theater as we know it forever. Do you think it will? And do you, how do you imagine our future as an industry? Um, I mean, the first thing to sort of acknowledge is that we just don't know. Like, um, I don't think, yeah, we could never, I don't know, even if you, you know, in January last year, before the pandemic had like it hit the, you know, Europe um, and, and the UK. Do I have to say the UK is separate from Europe now? I'm not sure because that thing happened as well. Um, um, yeah, sorry about that. <laughs> That's like just, yeah, so yeah, I think if you were, yeah, if you were to present, presented us in January last year, with the foresight that a pandemic of respiratory disease is going to hit um and like cause major changes like i don't know like i don't know how much we would have been able to vision even with that knowledge and that certainty we were able to vision like what things would be like right now a year on what would have happened because it's not just about what, what theater does it's also about what like the whole yeah, you know, what what our governments do, like what the kind of like is done, like economically, which is you know sort of there is a responsibility for the sector to be looking out for those who've been like most 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 impacted by this. But it's kind of it's also yeah you know, economically, it's kind of that's the kind of that that's the question for the whole the whole of you know our kind of our societies. Like what you know, how do we do this? They're really big questions, and they're kind of and they're really really sudden changes that we're not. You know, we're just not used to um, something happening, hitting everybody, and like so quickly. And so, like, yeah, right now we're in, we're in lockdown three, um, the worst of the lockdowns. Um, um, and like, no, you know, is this the end of the trilogy, um, or is this like, you know, more of a Fast and Furious um, like sequence, which is just going to be like continuing forever? Um, some of the theatre buildings were preparing to open again um, in like before Christmas. And then, you know, lockdown two hits and, you know, literally like, you know, the national opening show for night and then have to close it again. And then immediately that's going to make everybody more cautious because the kind of the hit that will have been taken by that ill fortune um, is going to be huge. So, yeah, we don't know. And in some ways, I think that all we can kind of do right now for this, I'm, I'm guessing for this year, is be ready for kind of uncertainty and therefore I think uh focusing on kind of like what makes us resilient um and that would be um kind of flexibility and being able and ready to like you know switch how we're presenting things and also sort of like kind of experimenting to find different ways of like bringing people together to play um or to watch a play yeah, we're going to be on the other side of this at some point. Um, although I, don't, I also, but I also think that we're going to be living with um, this virus um, and yeah, with in sort of like at least mild pandemic mode for years to come. Theatre has kind of like um, often kind of like I, I would say like kind of evolved. But yeah, yeah, once it was like the major narrative medium for most for most audiences, like television doesn't exist, radio doesn't exist, like. Um, you might go to the theatre for, you know, to like, to, to, yeah, be told stories, like in a way that now, um, yeah, probably particularly in lockdown for a lot of us, that primary mode of being told stories might be just to flick on Netflix. Um, but that when, when that sort of like shifts, I think that then becomes a greater appreciation for what is it that only this mode of like, stories and play and gathering can can do but you can make anything that you know within reason like there's kind of all these different models all these different formats of exploring so why not pick the the kind of the format that absolutely best suits what you want to talk about 
and who you want to like be doing that with and who is going to be making it and where are they going to be meeting and like and what you know to do do the things that it does best and i think you could see yeah, you know, in the kind of like uh mid to late 90s i don't know what sort of like what drove this but there was there was a real i felt there was a kind of a real exploration and innovation of form maybe i mean it's often to do with like other things in society like kind of i think there's a huge scene that kind of erupted because i mean i, I would say inspired by shunt followed by punch drunk in the uk that was about the was making immersive work but was also about taking over sites and the adventure of an audience like kind of going to that site kind of as well as part of the whole kind of experience that really like changed things for a while and then becomes like kind of assimilated into the kind of the kind of the great repertoire of like the things that we can do so we've similarly you know we've, we've had a little kind of explosion of like of innovation and exploration and experimentation that's been driven by this kind of crisis we've been plunged into and i think that these forms and these formats will remain they might not be you know but then there'll be a, perhaps there'll be alongside what we can do when we can gather in 650 seat theaters um and yeah look at the kind of that that beautiful curtain rising like together you know that, i mean in a way that's my hope um and that we kind of take from this so that we're kind of better able to appreciate what it is when we all come together um but also we can also yeah you know, we can choose to rather than be forced to like make the things that only this this can do i could never quite have got my head around like the magic that kind of comes from making things on zoom simply from the fact that audiences from different parts of the world can kind of connect together i'll tell you quickly a little story um so i understand a role but this is a nice story um, um, in one of the telephone performances last summer, um, there was an audience person um, who I will call Hannah, not her real name, but it's kind of the same initial, who was in New Zealand. And she tried to come the previous weekend, but Zoom had kicked her out because technology is always a bit fucked. Uh, sorry, technology always um, is fragile. And then kind of, so given her a comp to come back the following weekend for a show that was like in the morning, like UK time. And the, um, and then um, when it comes to recreating that phone call between Bell and Watson, uh, the person who ends up being cast as Bell is a woman called Sarah, um, who is in Staffordshire in the UK. And, um, as I'm chatting to Sarah to kind of see you know, to kind of like bring her into like what she needs to do to play Belle, thinking who I'm gonna like gonna cast Watson, uh, Hannah in the chat is suddenly going, Oh my god, Sarah, is is that you? Um and like it turns out, so they're yeah, they're they're eleven thousand miles apart, they're old friends and ex colleagues who haven't seen or spoken to each other in ten years, and they both happen to be there together in this moment. And then obviously bring Hannah in to play Watson. And the two of them have this reunion in front of everybody and then you know play the kind of the kind of quite ridiculous first phone call ever, and then kind of collapse in hysterics. And like and it's you know, it's just the most beautiful thing. Like so I want to be able to continue to like explore making pieces which can bring people together in these kind of like kind of magical ways. Who do we look to? in the UK or anywhere in the world when it comes to wanting to learn how to make digital theatre. I think that is something that maybe we're not really talking about enough because um, when this lockdown hit, I think a lot of people were expected to just be able to direct on Zoom or be able to do design on Zoom or be able to do interactive theatre on Zoom. And I think there's not a lot of, um, not a lot of tools for that for people who are maybe emerging or will have to be working like this for the next couple of years tony um like sort of teaching kind of quite a lot in like different kind of courses in like drama schools and um yeah we were we were penciled to uh, deliver a course for central school um in may um last year but that we could have been that had been scheduled like the year before um and then obviously like when it kind of comes to deliver the course suddenly we're doing kind of over zoom and then but then i think just being able to kind of then focus on 
what is it that yeah what yeah okay let's, so let's talk about and let's yeah, explore making pieces that can yeah that can happen now and I think everybody's been kind of doing this kind of learning and as much I'm really keen on like not just who might be teaching but also like what can we exchange with each other like yeah what kind of networks that can Coney has a network um, a wider network that's open to anybody who's interested in making this kind of this kind of play um and that's uh and a kind of a principle kind of a, like a free exchange of practice um and that's you know not saying we are the only ones by any stretch but i think that that yeah that, that it's rather but certainly that's open to anybody like you know i can give you the link to share um but also i think the principle of like what can we learn from each other what can we exchange with each other because they're brilliant brilliant artists all over the world who are like you know plunging in and you know figuring stuff out and finding things that are just you know just wonderful um and pieces by i haven't played enough what else is out there but some of the pieces that i've played have been like, wow that's you know that's uh remarkable um and yeah to be just drawing inspiration from each other um and feeling that we're all in this together like that, i think that's the kind of the most important thing that's a brilliant way to end our chat i think that i i feel very positive about the future now which i always do when i talk to you <laughs> that's nice well ditto <laughs> well um i only have one last question for you if you were here with me and if anything were possible what would you like to see in this space what would you make um gosh I mean, I've literally never get asked this question, uh, you know, the, the, you know, pandemic or, or otherwise. I'm remembering a astounding piece made by Fevered Sleep, who are like an extraordinarily beautiful, like, you know, company of artists by David Harradine um, here in the UK. Years ago, that in an old theater in Alexander Palace, it's a show for one person at a time, um, but you can go into like a little kind of foyer, like in, it's very much in a kind of like an old theater like kind of vibe and kind of like a little bit kind of surreal and then the kind of door would open and you'd walk in to like this old crumbling um yeah semi-derelict building on the inside still you know kind of the I can't remember, it, might, it might have been fire damage at some point but it sort of burn it a little bit if that's okay um I'll try my best. And, and then there's like there was just there was like one seat in the middle of this space and the light, light, lights that kind of drew you to go and sit in that in that seat when you sat in the seat then suddenly yeah everything kind of went to pitch darkness and you're sitting alone and then just gradually the kind of the theater kind of wakes up just in sound and in light um for about 20 minutes and just the sort of most just just yeah I'm getting shivers like thinking about it again so i'd, I'd like to make anything that was half as good as that yeah Actually, I'm now remembering. Actually, there's an old, there's a really old piece before Coney was Coney that we made. Um, that actually was like inviting an audience to a theatre, and then we we weren't there, but we'd left the means for them to make to make the show, including like a kind of a C90 uh, cassette that was like um, in a zip up rabbit, like a kind of cuddly toy, um, and then that was a series of cues. Um, like a sonic cue, so the whole thing lasted 43 minutes from the point where they put the tape in the player, and then um, and then there were envelopes scattered everywhere with instructions to open after a particular after a particular cue, um, and it was a whole kind of reflection on like what it is that we're making like when we make this together. So I'd like to do that with hundreds of audience, um, and having also some of the qualities kind of like phantasmagorical qualities that that piece of sleep piece had um yeah that's my that's my best answer well thank you so much tassos for being here and for sharing your wisdom it is always such a pleasure to listen to you thank you thank you I always like yeah likewise um to listen to you as well um and uh yeah stay well and i think it's what we always have to say like at, at every punctuation now and um yeah all the best to everyone over there thank you stay well and stay safe yeah. this was traverse thank you so much for joining us and join us next time to see what's next